he had stumbled upon this stand of trees and a stone circle with a fire pit made by someone who might have lived here in an older time. There was no sign of a cabin. If there had been one, it had long been taken by the forest that surrounded him. A small pile of wood sat stacked nearby, sitting beneath a covering of snow, but dry still the same and ready for fire. Perhaps it was more decomposed than dry, but it would serve his purpose just the same. The fire pit had not been used for some time. The last time it was used, someone had probably, like he, stumbled upon it while hunting maybe, and claimed it as a ready-made camping fire pit. That fire had left behind charred pieces of wood that could still be used. Mac had been struggling towards home for many hours. The horse he was riding had put a foot down through a rotten log on the wooden bridge, and they had both gone sideways, crashing through the side and ending up in the river. His horse hit a rock and was no more. He sliced a leg against the same rock, and as he dragged himself from the water, he immediately knew the enormity of his situation. Horse, supplies, everything went drifting down the river. He was alone, far from home, in the cold of winter with a leg that was rushing to drain him of every last drop of blood he had. He took his belt and wrapped it just above the gash and pulled tight, his eyes blurred with the agony of the shock from the pain that jolted his entire body. No one would be on a road this time of night. Three choices. Stay on the road and struggle home as best he could. Cut through the woods and save half the distance. Or mark the place where Mac Hayden had drawn his last breath. So, here he was in the middle of the woods many hours later. The bleeding stopped, but the wound lay gaping wide and oozing the very essence of his life away. His clothes had still not fully dried. He had struggled for hours, body heat disappearing into the wet clothes and the silent world around him. He was now out of energy and heat. He had moved from preventing his bleeding to death to his new killer, exhaustion and freezing to death. He needed desperately to bring the odds back in his favor, or at least to where he had a fighting chance. He was comfortable in the forest, he knew the trees and the animals that made it their habitat. He could find food if he needed. He knew how to make a camp that would keep him warm. But this knowledge was useless without the energy to perform the tasks. He had his flint and steel in his pocket, but the tinder of charred linen was still wet and would not catch. He also had a fire glass, but that was useless without the sun. He took a piece of old burnt wood from the fire pit turned it over to its drier side, and used his knife to make a pile of small shavings. Darkness had moved in hours ago, but he had kept going under the light of a half moon. He was hoping to make it back to his farm before the cold and exhaustion took over. That was no longer an option. He assessed the situation and knew that his best chance to survive would come from a place to rest dry out and regain what energy he could. It was still a long way home. This fire pit had come none too soon. He felt a tinge of gratitude and joy at having found it. That feeling was as fleeting as a falling leaf in a winter's gale. His ears strained to focus. The silence that had followed him thus far had just deserted him. He heard the howl of wolves in the distance. He looked about and hoped they had not picked up his scent just yet. He knew they would. It was just a matter of time. They were night hunters, and they gave signals to any other wolves that they were in their territory and on the hunt. He was making more noise than a new baby without a bottle. What they could not smell, he was compensating for with noise. A fire was definitely his next goal, or die trying. He needed kindling. The charred wood would catch the sparks, but it needed something to start the fire. Birch. He needed small shavings of birch bark. 
He stumbled around, moving as far as he dared from the fire pit, the howls of the wolves growing louder. Finally, a small birch. He peeled what he could of the small white exterior of the bark and put it in his pocket. He took bigger rind from the base, but was careful not to destroy the tree that he was using to save himself. He left alone the inner bark and only took what was loose to his touch. He stumbled his way back to the fire pit, placed the charred shavings in the middle, the tinder of birch park around the side, and took out his flint and steel. He hit it once, twice, and a spark hit the charred shavings. He closed his eyes from the smoke that would come, bent down and blew lightly, blinking his eyes quickly to see as the smoke began to form and rise. He blew again and with more consistency, blinked again and moved the birch bark closer. The fire ignited and he added small sticks. The fire expanded and took hold. He sat without moving for a few short minutes. His body began to shake with cold and a deep, draining exhaustion. He wanted to lay down and sleep, if only for a short time. He shook his head, and with the full realization that a sleep now would quickly end in death. The fire was still small and incapable of lasting but for a short spell. The cold would take him if the wolves did not find him first. He needed to get bigger wood on the fire. He struggled to his one good leg and moved sluggishly toward the small pile of wood. He took what was there and tossed it near to where he would sit. He returned and carefully placed a few chunks of wood into what was now a heat and life producing savior. The bay of the wolves was loud and willful. He could not yet tell their distance from him. They were certainly moving closer. He had enough wood to keep the fire going for hours but not until dawn. The wolves would smell the blood soon. They were approaching him downwind. More bad luck that was not of his making. They would know that he was wounded. Mac had no fear of wolves in the daytime. He was a capable hunter, and he also knew that during the day they were less likely to take on a hunter. They had learned over time to be cautious of men. He gave them the respect they deserved in their woods and would go out of his way to ensure their safety and survival. But this was nighttime, and here he was fighting for his life. It was not enough that he could bleed to death or die from hypothermia, but the damn wolves were moving in to claim him as their evening meal. He saw their eyes first. One lone wolf, the leader. It edged its way towards Mac, not at all afraid of the fire. They were typically weary of fire, but the smell of blood was too enticing. It triggered their knowledge of an easy kill. The wounded was by far their choice to kill. It was not just their way, but nature's way. Then he saw four other wolves moving in behind, tails low, their bodies creeping slowly but inexorably behind their leader and towards Mac. He pulled a junk of wood from the fire holding tight the end that had yet to catch fire. He moved it in front of him, the only sword he had at his disposal. He would take down at least one of them. They could have him for supper. There would be one less doing the eating. The leader wolf gave a growl and started forward. The other four leaped into the air and moved in for the kill. From behind him he heard the high-pitched wail of another wolf. They had completely encircled him. He had not even noticed the ones at his back. They were indeed going to eat well tonight. The leader took its killing leap, its jaws open. As it did, a flurry of feet and fur flew over his head from behind. Four wolves hit the leader almost at one. He stopped dead in the air and went down. The growls and tearing sundered in the night. It was over before it started. The other four wolves who had followed the leader turned and ran. The four wolves that had flew over Mac's back stood with their backs to him and the fire. Their heads were low in preparation for any further attack from the other pack. Blood stained their maws. The big gray began a howl, and then the pack of four howled into the night. They gave their message that they had now claimed the territory. 
The big gray who hit the leader of the other pack stopped howling, turned, and looked at Mac. Mac could only steer. Then the memory returned. He had been hunting some time ago when he came across a wolf den. Wolves stay hidden in the day and move mostly at night. But there, outside the den, were four cubs frolicking in the sun. Their mother should have at least had come and give a warning to his approach. He looked about cautiously and saw behind a rock almost hidden. The mother had a long open wound along her side as if gored by some horned animal, perhaps in her last attempt to get food for the pups. The pups would die here. Mac took all four in his backpack and carried them back to his farm, where he fed them until a few months later he again set them free back at the place he had found them. At first they had tried to follow him back, but he finally left them with enough meat to chew on that they ignored his escape. He never saw them again and could only wish they had survived. And here they were. He put the junk of wood back into the fire, exhausted. The big gray moved forward slowly and put his muzzle against Mac's chest. The big gray rubbed his head and placed his scent upon the man that was his. The man who had cared for him just two summers ago. All four sat on guard until the dawn as Mac slept deeply beside the fire. He awoke and with the pack flanking his every move he struggled to his farm where they howled a final farewell and disappeared into the forest. Mac never again saw those wolves but every time he heard the distant howling in the night he gave up a smile and a thank you and then he felt the kinship. <laughs>